Sunday, August 18, 2024. I'm Anthony Davis. Welcome to The Weekend Show, where we make the time to consider the news of the week. You can support my work and independent journalism at patreon.com slash five minute news. Our guest today is a physician, a forensic and social psychiatrist, and a world expert on violence, and is currently president of the World Mental Health Coalition. She became known to the public as the editor of the New York Times bestseller, The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump. 37 psychiatrists and mental health experts assess a president. She predicted that the Trump presidency would not end with the 2020 election and warned of the violence that was to come. Dr. Bandy Lee, welcome back to The Weekend Show. Thank you for having me back. So we have so much to talk about. Um, the political landscape has changed unrecognizably just in the last month with Joe Biden stepping aside and endorsing his vice president, Kamala Harris, for president. Um, Donald Trump did not like that. He didn't see it coming. He planned to kind of pit against Joe Biden, who he thought was a an easy person to win against. Now Trump is the oldest uh, candidate in the race, and Kamala Harris's polls are shooting up every single week. Again, not something that the narcissistic personality of Donald Trump takes very kindly to. So I want to talk about how his kind of mental health has evolved during this period. But first, I just want to hear from you just your reaction to the the current Donald Trump, the one that we're getting since the race changed. Yes, I think the contrast is quite remarkable in that, uh, well, I've commonly, uh, I was asked about Joe Biden's mental health and I continued to try to divert the attention back to Donald Trump because uh, he was the one who was deflecting and projecting his own problems onto uh, Biden. And unfortunately, by the time uh, he was running for office again, he had carried on too much of that that projection with the public not quite understanding that it is indeed uh, exaggerated projection of Donald Trump's own impairments. Uh, but now we see the contrast of Biden as uh any fit person would do, uh, was able to concede. He was flexible enough to remove himself, although it was not something he wanted to do, obviously. Um, and uh, the Democratic Party itself was able to uh, uh, change gears onto a new candidate who, in historically unprecedented ways politically, um, and, and all these are signs of health the flexibility, resilience, and ability to meet the needs of the time, no matter how radical or how uh, dramatic a change it calls for. Donald Trump, on the other, other hand, we see the same has not happened. In fact, he's having a great difficulty uh, pivoting his message, his uh, ability to cope with the situation. And you pointed out very well that uh, he is, his emotional fragility is such that he was never able to, uh, he, he had trouble even uh, maintaining himself when he was, had all the advantages, even while he was the US president. He could not uh, tolerate his having, not having the biggest crowd size at inauguration, for example. And, and now he's fixated on the same issues and not able to get out of them. But this is what we predicted from the very start, that we are dealing with someone who is severely mentally impaired, who is uh, impaired to the point of being dangerous and even existentially dangerous. And those dangers actually have not gone away. So uh, while... Uh, Everyone, like myself, uh, isn't rejoicing that we now have a very viable option to defeat Donald Trump at the ballot box. Uh, what is happening to him psychologically, uh, we see, obviously, that he is disintegrating, deteriorating, uh, and falling apart. That, that may not be so obvious to many of his followers 
And uh, as he continues to hold press conferences and continues to try to, uh, to survive this moment, he may very well uh, recapture the public again. Uh, and that's what I describe as Trump contagion. So the advance of the Trump contagion uh, should not exceed uh, what, what is unraveling before our eyes in terms of his mental health, as well as uh, the healthy responses on the part of his opponent. That's what I want to talk to you about, is how the support doesn't seem to be wavering for Donald Trump. I mean, it amazes me that he was polling at nearly 50%, and even now it's down 47, 45. But that's not the point. That's still 45% potentially of the electorate that thinks that despite all of the insanity, and all of the the racism and the bigotry and the hatred and the negativity and obviously the lies, that he's still their man. And, and obviously that says quite a lot about America. But what does it say about the Trump contagion syndrome, this notion that once people are in the cult of Trump, that it, whatever he does, their, their support will be unwavering? So my fear is that uh, now that we have a very viable candidate, uh, who has not been the depository of so much projection and, and, uh, manipulation, uh, on the part of Donald Trump that we're starting anew and we have renewed hope. Uh, but what we do not recognize is that we cannot deal with this situation as an ordinary presidential campaign. As long as we have mental pathology in politics, which is how I've been describing fascism, because it's not really a political ideology. In fact, it's something that follows along the principles of psychiatry that psychiatrists like myself and other mental health experts deal with on an everyday basis in our practice. Um, that uh, as you know, very early on, um, when, uh, the Trump presidency started, we actually decided, uh, that we should come public with our medical consensus. And that's how I held the conference at Yale School of Medicine, which, uh, was immediately caught on by the news in 50 different countries and five continents at that time. And I was invited by, um, Congress members to speak with them and eventually to meet with them. Uh, when our book came out, it was an unprecedented New York Times bestseller of its kind, The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump. And uh, within three months, we were the number one topic of national conversation. That was actually an organic development on the part of the people uh, trying to address the, the very distressing reality that they saw before them. And even when we were meeting with Congress members and we eventually met with over 50 of them, uh, they were looking to us to speak about uh, the problem uh, medically so that they could intervene politically. And so that would have been a rational approach. What happened, unfortunately, was that at the height of our influence, when even senior journalists told us that we have we had arrived. In other words, we had made an intervention possible so that we could stop this uh, incredible threat to our nation and the world um, in a rational way. But that was when the American Psychiatric Association intervened very aggressively with alongside uh, the pharmaceutical industry supported New York Times. And uh, blacked us out of uh, all major media within two or three weeks. It was very dramatic. And ever since, um, well, we are experiencing what we would predict in such a situation, that the pathology would not go away on its own, just like the COVID-19 pandemic doesn't just go away because you wish for it. Uh, but continue to spread. And I've been trying to describe that as from contagion uh, because we often think of ourselves as being isolated individuals, especially in terms of mental health. But in fact, uh, we're, we're highly interconnected and symptoms do spread. Uh, 
uh, social media studies have shown that negative emotions spread more quickly than positive ones. Well, delusions spread more quickly than uh, ordinary thought and, uh, and severe symptoms spread much more rapidly. And so, uh, so what we're dealing with now is not a simple political phenomenon. And, and we've made the error again and again of trying to deal with it as such. Uh, I'm afraid we're, we're still not prepared. And this election will be uh, a really critical one. And for that reason, uh, we're trying to make up for the vacuum of mental health expertise in that um, we're, we're, going, we're planning on a major all-day conference at the National Press Club. We've gotten a small amount of donation to be able to begin the project, but uh, we'll need a lot more funding. Uh, we're in the midst of doing fundraising, but if it were to go major, uh, we'd like to feature, uh, as we did in, in our last major conference there in in the year before the 2020 election, we featured 13 experts from all different uh, fields. Uh, they were top experts in the country coming together with mental health experts to say that uh, the dangerous state of the world requires fit leadership and that uh, that conference was considered important enough to be covered by C-SPAN of all the three hours. Uh, we'd like to put together something like that again. And that is basically to warn at the most critical time, perhaps in our history so far, of the importance of considering these, these matters, which have been ignored so far. There has been a little bit of a shift in terms of the media's understanding of his, of his mental health condition. George Conway started a pack uh, about, you know, him being unfit to, to lead. Uh, Dr. John Gartner's started a Shrinking Trump podcast, which is getting a lot of attention, where, you know, his, his not just his mental decline, because there's two things, isn't there? There's the dementia issue, which is not something that, uh, you know, worries me so much because, <laughs> you know, it's it's a slow progressing illness. But the, and the very greater obvious threat to the public, it, and yeah. and very obvious, right? But but the greater threat is the political rhetoric that is born of the narcissistic personality disorder, and to the point that you know he undoubtedly plans to um, cheat in this election as he did in twenty twenty, whether it be claiming that the election's over at nine p.m. because you know, the, all, all of the lineup votes have been counted and the mail-in ones haven't. Or there is talk of the fact that they've already installed election deniers in these state legislatures who will refuse to certify the election and so that the election will effectively be undecided and Donald Trump will claim that he is the winner. Obviously, the media is keeping an eye on that. I'm slightly concerned <laughs> that... We don't have enough systems, checks and balances in place to protect us from that. And then, of course, we have the relationship with the Heritage Foundation and, and also the, the MAGA Supreme Court, and, and, and that doesn't help matters either. So, so there will be clearly another January 6th-style event. Do you think that's the reason why Trump doesn't seem to be making much effort to campaign? Because... He's not traveling the country like Kamala Harris and Tim Walls is. He's doing these kind of weird press conferences at his own venues. Is it that in the back of his mind, he's been reassured that he's got the election in the bag and therefore he doesn't have to do traditional electioneering to win it? I think he understands very well that traditional campaigning is not what he needs. What he needs is public exposure in order to spread his symptoms. That's what he has survived on and what his popularity has risen on uh, and how he has also manipulated the media in ways where it used to be that propaganda channels would 
uh, shape people's thoughts. But uh, now he has the media following him because they have figured out that his uh, spread of symptoms is far more catching um, in ways that will uh, boost ratings and and uh, bring revenue in ways that nothing else uh, they have seen can. Um, and so he is, I believe, deliberately avoiding venues that uh, Harris and Walls are, are seeking. I think he had that one um, uh, rally in the same stadium even that uh, Kamala Harris did hers and, and found uh, such a stark comparison that so much so that he had to come up with uh, even delusional level ideas, such as that her crowds are artificial intelligence generated, that uh, his crowds were 30 times larger, uh, that that he had a bigger crowd than Martin Luther King Jr. That kind of thinking shows his fragility, but it also shows that his survival mechanism will be kicking in. And uh so much so that he knows, well, he he has honed this in his entire life. He's a master manipulator. People think of him as a, as a great entertainer, a great salesman, but it goes beyond that. Uh, his symptoms are such that he, uh, people like he were called spellbinders because once they get into the public arena, they can beguile and uh, hypnotize people in ways that few people can and certainly rational persuasion can can very can do very little of uh, i'm very glad that there's more discourse on his mental impairments and unraveling and many people who are speaking have gotten their information from us and um and i hope one day george conway will speak about the input i gave him on his own article um uh but uh, People, uh, we also need to deal with it in a sober uh, way that will truly put in safeguards and give us an understanding of what we are dealing with. I think Conway has been focusing on uh, provoking Trump and uh, getting him to show his symptoms for others to see, which is also a good method. But we also need to be aware of the extreme dangers that that will bring because he is, he has a, a far more ballooned uh, sense of himself and his expectations have gone far beyond even his first presidential term. And not only that, he has institutions and uh, groups and power structures to support him, as you said, the Heritage Foundation, the uh, Supreme Court, as well as um, foreign leaders who would do anything to put him back in power, including in endangering the safety of the entire globe. Uh, I'm speaking specifically of Vladimir Putin and Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, who were vastly psychologically emboldened during Trump's presidency. People uh, by, by his rhetoric that he was a peaceful president who didn't start any wars, but you could see how much of a, a shift in geopolitical uh, direction he has induced, not, not only by upending the world order and uh, creating a climate for conflict over uh, cooperation and building alliances, but uh, he has really emboldened uh, dangerous dictators who mirror his his psychology. And, of course... So we're that, seeing that in Turkey, we've seen that in Venezuela, we've seen it in Hungary. So, so you're saying that Donald Trump, by nature of being the American president that had these extremist positions and was and, and did not subscribe to the institutions and the protocols... That gave rise, I mean, Bolsonaro, I guess, in Brazil, though he's not there anymore, is another example, where they, they become copycat dictators, because if he can do it, they can do it too. Yes, absolutely. You as a global traveler would, would know, as, as I have, uh, having studied global health, 
just how influential uh, American practices are abroad, even our errors. Yes. And, um, and to add mental symptoms on top of that makes it, um, makes it hugely influential and, uh, spreading and contagious. Um, and we see it not only in foreign leaders, but also in domestic leaders and politicians and local governments, how much of a cultural shift he has enabled. And, and interestingly, once these dictators become criminalized or the threat of criminality, so Netanyahu with his corruption trials is an example. Berlusconi in Italy was another one who, when they, when they are fighting the judiciary, their politics becomes more extreme and their rhetoric becomes more extreme. And with Donald Trump, with his 34 felony counts, the sexual abuse, not to mention the, the trials that haven't even come to bear yet. I mean, he is having to ramp up the rhetoric, mainly because he knows that if he doesn't win the presidency, he's going to go to jail. That's right. So he's vying not just for the presidency, but trying to keep himself out of prison. And we underestimate him if we do not stretch our imagination to uh, consider all the possible actions that he could take, and he would stop at nothing. Uh, in fact, because he was not held accountable for the first uh, attempt to overturn the government, the second time will be far more, far bolder and uh, better planned, especially with those who are helping him. He has vast uh, groups, oligarchs, uh, power structures supporting him, not because they like him, but because he is useful to them for his mental impairments. It's so interesting. Okay, I want to talk about his attempted assassination next and how that might have affected him, if at all, interestingly. We'll do that next here on The Weekend Show. I'm excited to tell you about Moink. That's Moo plus Oink. Moink is a meat subscription box company on a mission to fight for the family farm. They're located in rural America, run by an eighth-generation female farmer, their animals are raised humanely, their employees are paid a living wage, and the quality of their product is better than anything you'll find in a store. Moink delivers grass-fed and grass-finished beef and lamb, pastured pork and chicken, and sustainable wild-caught Alaskan salmon straight to your door. Moink farmers farm like our grandparents did, and as a result, Moink meat tastes like it should, because the family farm does it better, and the Moink difference is a difference you can taste. Unlike the supermarket, Moink gives you total control over the quality and source of your food. You can choose the meat delivered in every box, like ribeyes to chicken breasts, pork chops to salmon fillets, and much more. Plus, you can cancel any time. Moink is helping to save rural America. Join the Moink movement today. Keep American farming going by signing up at moinkbox.com slash weekend right now. And listeners to this show get free hot rolls in your first box. The best hot rolls you'll ever taste, but for a limited time. Spelt M-O-I-N-K box.com slash weekend. That's moinkbox.com slash weekend. We're back with Dr. Bandy Lee here on The Weekend Show. I'm Anthony Davis. Um, a, a, an unprecedented event happened a few weeks ago, which none of us could have predicted, and that was that Donald Trump experienced an attempted assassination upon his life at his own rally. And on the other end of the, of the gun, or the AR-15, interestingly, was a Republican, young, white, male, who has voted for Trump previously, and so is his family, his parents. And he, he was neutralized, to coin a phrase from the Secret Service, immediately. But Donald Trump, by turning his head just an inch or two, dodged a bullet. I mean, that, that obviously nobody wants him dead. But at the same time, that was a, a, an historical moment that put him right back in the headlines. It also raised his messiah complex in a way, didn't it? 
and those evangelicals that think that, you know, he is invincible and that it was the fact that he's touched by the hand of God is the reason that he didn't die in that moment. Just talk to to the assassination from a you know from a clinical perspective. I mean, it's it's really the last thing you want to happen, you know, to a a, a narcissist in this way to survive this type of attack, right? Not only that, the way he responded to it by uh, putting his head up high and uh, raising his fist and uh, calling out "fight." Um, in ways that uh, discombobulated the Secret Service agents, apparently, uh, so much so that they they allowed him to be fully exposed. But that comes to show how great this need for external validation is, that even in a moment where he could have almost died, uh, well, he is not of such a psychological structure that that would have feared for his life above all else at that time as a normal person would do, but rather he was fearful that he would appear weak, which is why he went for his psychic survival above uh, his physical survival. So that was uh, one of the things that was remarkable to me. Uh, and of course, he immediately stated tried to state it in an understated way, but it was very obvious he was saying that the, he is somehow God, God ordained and chosen to uh, be con continuing and, and to avoid such a situation that came close to um, leading him to death. Uh, so you're right in that it fueled his Messiah complex. It was really an extraordinary event, both for for the way it happened. In fact, history was changed by just a couple inches and, um, and was very much on the way to creating a messiah. The Supreme Court made him a king. The assassination attempt made him a messiah. And it would have what, What's so interesting, in though, is direction. that he, you know, he is a coward. Right, he's he's clearly always been a coward, dating back to bone spurs, and all and everything else. But this event kind of gave the impression that he was the opposite of cowardly, and that's how he sold it to his supporters and followers. So he almost tried to take the credit for dodging the bullet. But and the the punching the air and getting that photograph, which he knew would go viral, because there was a small trickle of of you know this ear blood, not the lobe as he called it, but, which is way down here. He took no interest in the anatomy, but just in that moment, it it ricocheted around the world, and he knew that. He knew it as he was doing it, so much so that he put his own Secret Service people at risk, put their lives at risk by delaying his exit from the stage. And as we've seen yes. from previous assassination attempts, the Secret Service would remove the target immediately, and he wouldn't go. And, and that in itself, to me, was a display of how dangerous he is, the fact that he was happy for six or seven or, or eight other humans to take a bullet on his behalf. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's very much uh, in the manner that he tried to show he was brave against COVID and uh, look at how I survived it. Don't let it, uh, yes, don't, don't be fearful of it, uh, despite the hundreds of thousands of people he would be imperiling. And uh, that is appears extraordinarily brave because ordinary people are not capable of that kind of uh, defiance. But it actually comes from his pathology, once again, that he is not so tethered to reality that he does not truly consider the dangers. He does not 
believe they apply to him. And rather what is important to him is uh, what he is able to not only use that occasion to garner support, but but to uh, buttress this uh, otherworldly, godly image of himself. Uh, and, and, and that's- to sell merchandise as well, of course. Exactly. Uh, it's, it's a kind of uh, sales pitch. Um, yeah. It's his own advertising, which he has honed over the course of his entire life to compensate for the deficiencies that he has. What we don't recognize is that sometimes mental impairments can manifest in masterful manipulation and the, out of this hunger for external, uh, not only validation, but deception and um, and uh, uh, a grandiose um, delusion of oneself that one wishes to cultivate, not just for, for oneself, but for, for one's audience, um, that, that that can manifest in this kind of image. So that is why I feel that the expertise of mental health professionals was so critical from early on to point out that the most dangerous disorders are not so obvious, uh, are not what we typically think of as a dangerous individual, for example. Um, I mean, I've dealt with many violent offenders and uh, they actually uh, present in very similar ways. They would, um, not think twice about uh, risking their lives just to get back at an insult uh, or to spend the rest of one's life in prison uh, because they couldn't hold back the anger and desire for revenge in that moment. But uh, they, they shrink like a two-year-old when they see the needle. <laughs> um, it's so It's so interesting. I want, do you remember the, the phone call that was leaked the night of the assassination attempt, where he called RFK Jr. And he sounded thrilled to have been shot at. His voice was energized. He was like, yeah, it was crazy. I mean, you know, the bullet came at me and I just turned my head. And, and, and he was talking in a way that he was boasting about it. Completely right. different to the very next day, which was the RNC convention where he spoke over this somber music and said, I shouldn't be here, and they tried to, to take me. Proof that it's all performative. But, you know, Trump was just talking about it just sounding like a large mosquito by his ear. And then, of course, we had the whole fake bandage situation where he didn't have a bandage on playing golf, then he's at the RNC with this huge bandage on so that everybody can see it. I mean, this is... For anyone who's interested in the, his pathology, this is a minefield of material, isn't it? Yes, because it's all about image, and all that matters is the image he projects. Um, I see it with violent offenders all the time. They may uh, fight to their death to, uh, to guard their honor, they say, but it's really uh, their image. Uh, they will uh, risk spending their, the rest of their life in prison and wear it as a badge of honor because they did not allow themselves to be diminished. And um, they're, they're often developmentally wounded themselves so that they are not to the point where uh, they consider risk to one's life and, and the ordinary things that adults are concerned about. Any adult who understands what that assassination attempt meant would not have dealt with it the way he had. They would, we would be much more serious about it and um, sober about it. People speculated though that it might change him. And I know that his kids were being interviewed about it and the media was saying with a straight face, has it changed him? Trying to talk about Donald Trump like he's neurotypical. And, you know, for those of us who, who are interested in, in, in mental health, we were like, 
you know, no. I mean, if anything, this has kind of egged him on and, and, and put him on an even greater pedestal. So what, what, what would you say about the way the media handled the coverage of the assassination attempt? Were you frustrated like I was about their naivety, expecting him to behave like a, a regular person? Well, it's actually been quite awful and uh, detrimental, in fact, dangerous to the public to be covering him as a normal individual. It's actually worse than no coverage at all. Um, and it has encouraged uh, his, uh, well, his wishful uh, desires to um to project his defenses, which are the opposite of his actual condition, uh, to be taken to be reality. And um, ever since the New York Times came out and uh, essentially denounced mental health experts as the only experts not allowed to speak on the area of their expertise, um, that we have been suffering from this this problem because uh because if anything mental health problems are require more expert input than almost any other because other things i talk about physical illnesses for example you would be the one taking yourself uh to the doctor in the hospital for care but when you are mentally afflicted then the very uh agency that would be able to seek help or find solutions is what is affected. And uh, we're currently still at that state. Um, it's great that mental health is more in the discourse, but I don't see the situation changing with uh, mental health experts being called to major programs as I was in the beginning. There was almost no uh, major news program I wasn't invited to, cable or network. Um, when we didn't have this disinhibition, this inhibition by, uh, the APA's disinformation campaign, um, they should have known that, uh, what they did was pull out an obscure Goldwater rule to, um, to advance the idea that those who, the conscientious independent mental health experts who are speaking up, uh, were being somehow unethical. But, uh, what it failed to mention was that the water rule itself uh, encourages public education. And the reason for its inclusion in the first place was to highlight our responsibility to the community and uh, our, our requirement to better public health. Uh, and then there's a Geneva Declaration that says that it's an absolute obligation that we speak up against a dangerous regime uh, having experienced uh, Nazi Germany and uh, the Geneva Declaration is a modification of the Hippocratic Oath that came out of the Nuremberg trials. That that but we. But this needed. is America, though, isn't it? And yes. This is this is what I've come to realize as a as a an immigrant living here is that America is like a it's like a a movie that is just permanently playing. Like people think that it's a film, they don't realize that it's real life. And so there is this aspect of, um, oh, it's like ambulance chasing. It's like the people that drive slowly past an accident just as if they can see anything dramatic. Whereas, you know, your heart tells you you shouldn't be looking, but your head's like, come on, show me, show me. And I feel that, you know, from living in the US now, as long as I have, that there is this disassociation that goes on with some people where they you know, they can read about fascism and they can read about these dictators of history, but they cannot connect it to their modern reality because of American exceptionalism, the fact that we've lived during peacetime in the main, and that the idea that the fall of US democracy is actually a reality. So could, could you talk to that, that this notion that, that, and it certainly includes the media, you know, that because invariably a lot of the media they like their jobs, they want to carry on doing their jobs, and they don't want to, in the same way that you were called out as an expert, they don't want to be called out. So they just want to get on with the status quo of just writing these 
you know, salacious celebrity stories of which Donald Trump is one. Yes, when we broke out uh, in the public sphere, uh, we were the number one topic of national conversation. And I was told that this was not supposed to happen, <laughs> that they had their uh, they had their narrative, they had their pundits, and they had a kind of storyline that they were supposed to tell. And uh, we were not supposed to simply um, catapult to public awareness by our expertise alone. And, uh, but that uh, precisely points to the problem. Why did the American Psychiatric Association come out with its disinformation campaign? Why did it silence mental health experts at all cost? It had no jurisdiction over anyone other than its members, which is 6% of the mental health professionals. And yet they uh, made the Goldwater rule a household phrase for a while when not even psychiatrists knew about it. Uh, we were never trained in it, but we were trained in the duty to warn, the duty to protect, the, the requirement to protect potential victims and the public in the case of danger. And uh, why did that kind of matter of fact, rational conclusion not, uh, not take root? Uh, and once it was about to, why did they have to root it out? at all cost. Uh, I was erased from uh, at least a dozen different uh, articles in the New York Times who tried to quote me and uh, the, I would be edited out at last minute, sometimes to the surprise of senior reporters. And um, why did uh, the, the chief editor of the opinion section try so hard, uh, even accepted a couple of my um, essays and, and could not get my opinion published? Uh, why did uh, 70 different invitations by CNN and MSNBC uh, get canceled at last minute? Many of them even recorded, but not aired. Uh, the latest was NPR, which was uh, very surprising to me, much to the surprise of the host who recorded a segment with me. And one of them was a very uh, popular show. So we know well, that. Thank goodness uh, for independent media, I was going to say, because, you know, you, you have found a, a, a voice and a platform in, in, in independent media. It's clear to the people now that so much of the media, not just the far right media, the Foxes and the Newsmaxes, but even the, the legacy networks and the corporate media, they are still rooting for Donald Trump for the win because he represents revenue and profit. And again, this goes back to this being a uniquely American problem, whereby so many decisions are made, not from an ethical perspective, but from a profit perspective. And that is why the US has the biggest economy. And that is why, you know, these, these networks turn the kind of profits that they should when really the news should not be for profit. And in the countries that do the best coverage, they, they're not for profit. And so, you know, my, my issue, and it's connected to my previous question, is this a uniquely American problem? That the well, truth is irrelevant, the facts are irrelevant, it's more about just, you know, the spotlight. I think it has become uh, a problem of our contemporary times where um, even a professional association as the American Psychiatric Association had to go against its own science to promote its disinformation, which brought in huge revenues. They got windfalls of federal funding and uh, obtained a building in the middle of Washington, DC under the Trump administration. And um, it's also happening with universities. Uh, of course, you know what happened in my situation. Uh, many were watching my lawsuit against Yale when I was dismissed uh, because, and, and I launched the lawsuit not so much for myself, but 
uh, to try to find out uh, what had happened so that this doesn't happen to other voices. What we know is that on spurious grounds, in fact, there were so many maneuverings and errors along the way uh, that it was quite obvious that uh, uh, the, the courts dismissed my case because it had to be dismissed, no matter what, uh, how little the, the argument had to do with the issue. A federal court not dealing with a federal issue of free, free speech. Um, even uh, Professor Lawrence Tribe was uh, astonished and furious. Well, we see um, a situation here where uh, not even academics and professors can speak up any longer. Uh, there is no protected sphere. So where will we get the truth and where will we um, get the information we need to solve the real problems of our day? It appears that we're not able to, even at the peril of our nearly becoming the first species in existence to bring about its own extinction. It, um, it is that serious, isn't it? And, that, and that's the bit that people can't quite comprehend. Is it because the threat is so great that people don't want to go there? You know, people just don't want to talk about it because it's, it's a subject that is... It's too abrasive, in a way. The idea that one man, in the case of Donald Trump, is capable of so much destruction is so dangerous. And, you know, we, we only, you know, he, he is with Putin and Kamala Harris is with Zelensky. And that's all you really need to know about this, uh, this, this race. And yet people are overlooking all of Putin's crimes. They're overlooking all of these all of the criminality associated with these corrupt nations and these corrupt dictators, because their worship of Donald Trump is such that he, he supporting him is worth it, even if it means the, the, the country crashing and burning. Well, because they see his power and his power is the power of mental pathology, the ability that's to very addictive mind. to them. Yeah. Yes. And uh, he circumvents rationality. Uh, he is able to enlist people uh, to uh, whip up a fervent following in ways that no rational person can. And uh, at the same time, as he is highly manipulable for uh, dangerous leaders who have nefarious intents. Uh, there's a huge difference between him in the position of the most powerful position in the most powerful nation of the globe uh, versus having a rational person who would not be so manipulable. So uh, my suspicion is that for this election, that there is really no room for complacency where absolutely overjoyed and and as I am that we have a truly viable candidate but it's not a done deal in the sense that um, people do not recognize what Donald Trump is further capable of what uh, institutions and um, those who are propping him up will not uh, uh, stop at doing and uh, and also our inability to address the issue for what it is. Again, I'm very happy that there's more of a mental health discourse going, but we're not addressing fitness and the fitness exam that we did that showed him unfit to hold any job, let alone the, the most difficult and intricate job uh, in existence. Uh, and, and just how serious this is. This was a panel of independent top mental health experts around the country. Uh, we've convened another panel to do a pre-sentencing report in which we did our dangerousness risk assessment for uh, Judge Juan Merkin in, in New York, only because he's the only judge who 
has gotten that far and has not been blocked. Uh, but his sentencing itself has been delayed uh, several months to the point where it will hardly matter for the election. So now it depends on the American people alone. Uh, we've been trying to get our message out, but apparently the media uh, are quite aware that uh, we are trying to get our message out and are blocking it except for when it's entertainment related, or if the person is not a real mental health professional, or even among mental health professionals, those who are more entertainment oriented than, than truly serious minded. And that concerns me. If that's the only message that can get out, how far can we go? And of course, the, the public is hungry for it. We know from the fact that just when anyone mentions it, uh, the, the, the public is just extremely responsive to that message. And I'm, I'm happy for Conway's, uh, anti-psychopath pack. In fact, we did, uh, we were able to score, um, Donald Trump on the psychopathy scale in, uh, assessing his dangerousness. And it is truly off the, off the charts, truly the most dangerous individual we could conceive of. And so what are we doing about it? And why aren't we mobilizing it to uh, the commensurate level that it that the situation demands? Um, that is what concerns me. And if the media are airing certain persons or certain messages, uh, it seems to be because they decided that it will not have the ultimate effect that we are hoping it would, which is to, to stop this um, advance of fascism in a way that will not only keep our democracy safe, but keep our survival uh, safe. We have to take another quick break, but I, I want to come back and, and finally just talk about his the way that he has changed in the last few weeks in terms of his his competence and if that is going to affect his potential um, ability to get elected and especially his presidency. That's next on The Weekend Show. Most Americans think they spend around $62 a month on subscriptions, but the real number is closer to $300. That is literally thousands of dollars every year, half of which we've probably even forgotten about. Thankfully, I started using Rocket Money. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills so that you can grow your savings. They found a bunch of subscriptions that I'd forgotten about, and they helped me cancel the ones that I didn't want anymore. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has saved a total of $500 million in cancelled subscriptions, saving members up to $740 a year when using all of the app's features. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash weekend. That's rocketmoney.com slash weekend. rocketmoney.com slash weekend. We're back on the weekend show with Dr. Bandy Lee. We're, we're seeing a, a Donald Trump in response to the success of Kamala Harris in, uh, in the polls become more explicit with his language, more abusive, more aggressive, saying that, you know, if, if she wins, you're not going to have a country anymore. He refers to a nation in decline, despite the fact that the country both economically and, and socially seems to be doing really rather well at the moment. He's also spoken about the fact that, you know, the threat of socialism and communism. Well, he said that uh, about Joe Biden the, the first time round, and, and it never materialized. He said it about Barack Obama and it, it didn't materialize. And Republicans have been saying this stuff for years and still we're a capitalist nation. So, you know, the, the reality of how the country is versus what he is describing are two very different things. Why is it that his supporters are not able to see the reality from, from the fantasy? Because even Fox News, when they were covering his crazy, weird press conference the other day, when he was talking about 
the economy and talking about the stock market crashing, which it, it didn't, they actually had to take the on-screen um, chiron off that showed the stock market, the live ticker of the stock market, because it contradicted what he was saying in the moment. I mean, that is the level of desperation with these propaganda networks. But I just struggle with how people can be convinced that the nation is in decline when it quite clearly isn't. Trump contagion? The spread right. of symptoms? I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. The spread of symptoms which have a need to invert reality. So the defenses will uh, take over. That's why his followers see Donald Trump as a strong person, not a weak one, as as a powerful, capable person, not someone who is unfit to hold any job. And uh, they have to overlook the actual reality that he, because of his mental impairments, caused more American deaths than all the wars at, since the Civil War combined. 1.2 American deaths from the COVID-19, uh, disastrous mismanagement um, from uh, the uh, almost overturning the government by violent insurrection, um, his uh, which is uh, betrayal, treason, as well as um, his uh, upending the world order in ways that we are experiencing such perilous geopolitical instability right now. Yeah, well, the shooting um, down of an airliner after he went after Soleimani is one that I often reference, where, you know, an airliner full of people who were, who were killed, innocent people who were killed because of the reaction to the way that he handled the, 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 the killing of, of Soleimani. And you could even connect the 40,000 dead Palestinians to Donald Trump's rhetoric as well. And and so, Absolutely. but that doesn't seem to affect him in any way, does it? If anything, it just gives him a, a greater hunger for power. Well, if you look back to all the rhetoric between uh, Donald Trump and Joe Biden, if Biden were excoriated for even just minor missteps or uh, impairments in the midst of uh, admirably carrying out his duties versus Donald Trump's severe uh, mental impairments, his psychotic spiral, uh, which I'm witnessing him experience as his uh, his presidential lead is uh, is unraveling, and um, his uh, uh, cognitive decline far more significant and and severe than anything Biden has shown, but. Um, as I said, Trump contagion affects both his followers and his opponents because of uh, first, his followers will take on his symptoms. You don't need physical exposure for the contagion to uh, take hold, uh, just uh, emotional bonds. And uh, his opponents will feel such pressure to uh, to believe in the way that he believes. Uh, that's why he goes for the big lie, the most outrageous um, pictures of reality you can imagine, uh, uh, saying that, um, well, saying that the election was stolen, for example, for example, when he so clearly lost, and uh, saying that he is, um, he was the best president for African Americans when he's one of the greatest racists we've seen, and and uh, even the and greatest president not. since Lincoln or Washington. I mean, he makes these That's extreme right. comparisons, and even as you mentioned earlier, the Martin Luther King Jr. speech, the you know the "I Have a Dream" speech, he he, which is arguably one of the great speeches in history, and he referenced that saying that his speech was not just better, but played to a bigger crowd and then lied about the, the geography of the situation. Yes. I mean, these are so blatant, aren't they? And so yes. what you're saying is that the Trump contagion is such that people, it, it's irrelevant that, because there's no barometer 
for reality versus the fantasy. You're just in the tank for Trump no matter what. And that in itself is a is a mental health issue on a national level. And it's not just about one doing, man. What he's doing yeah. is essentially toppling everyone so that they they will lose their bearing and forget right. what they were seeing and experiencing as reality uh, so that they will take on what he says in part, not to be threatened and intimidated. Um, and, and these are the kinds of things that uh, it's basically behavioral management that the public was tasked with and was had no way to carry out without expert input because no one really has handled this level of mental pathology before. Um, and of course, someone who is so pathologically impaired uh, will wish to in invert the very definition of what is health versus sickness than to admit that they are ill. So on, uh, that is Thursday, why I feel, can we, sorry, carry on. That, that is why I feel that regaining our grounding in reality is essential. And, and yeah. for people to hear from mental health experts, not just one or two, but a whole group of them, as we're trying to bring together at the conference, it will be a major all day conference at the National Press Club ballroom end of September, where we will bring together uh, a bunch of mental health experts, top experts who will contribute to a new short book, which we will also prevent at, present at that time called The More Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, Psychiatrists and Mental Health Experts Warn Anew. And we will also present uh, top experts of other fields who will attest to uh, just how important this issue is for all other areas to carry out ordinary business. We have seen that ordinary politics is not possible unless we have a basic level of mental health, unless we address that issue for what it is and not something else. Uh, we will not have any of this under control, just like the COVID-19 pandemic. It doesn't just right. go away because we wish it away. We have to yeah, deal with it. you need expertise. Yes, in its own terms. Wouldn't it be interesting if the news networks, instead of having these political pundits on with their opinions all the time, where they get they all sit round a table and they all that the, the the experts were either clinical experts or people who had actually studied political science. You know, where, where we had a greater level of a kind of academic understanding of these situations. My, my fear is that people are so, not all people, I'm not, you know, I don't want to generalize, but some people are, are, are so far removed from academia that they will listen to what you're saying and be like, well, that's just her opinion, without any understanding of the decades of, of, not just education, but experience you have in the field. And that is something that has happened across the board with expertise. And Dr. Anthony Fauci, I guess, is the perfect example of this, someone who devoted his life to, to public health and was just ridiculed by the right and by Donald Trump as being, you know, an enemy of the people, um, which is terrifying. Could we just talk very quickly, though, to Thursday at a, an, an event? It was a um, Trump was at an event with Jewish supporters at his golf club in Bedminster. And it was it was meant to center on fighting anti-Semitism. Well, Trump ended up saying that a civilian presidential medal of freedom is better than the medal of honor because soldiers who are recognized are in very bad shape or they're dead. I mean, this, you know, it's, you couldn't even make this up if you tried. Dr. Lee, I mean, that, this is what's so frightening about it. And, and this really ties into his view of the uh, of, of people who are in the military. We had a similar thing with, you know, with his references to John McCain. You know, I prefer, prefer veterans who don't get captured and all this stuff. I mean, what is his beef with this kind of notion of the, of the, of the military? 
considering that he always claims that, you know, he, under him, the military was the toughest and the strongest. It, again, it's a contradiction, isn't it? Yes, but it's not a contradiction in terms of his symptoms. Um, right. He is perpetually trying to avoid facing his own weakness, his own frailty, even as a human being. That's why he has to be godlike, uh, cho chosen by God, the second coming of God. Uh, he's said many of these things. And um, he cannot face or even conceive of honoring what he sees as weakness because it brings attention to his own weakness. And we haven't seen it only in Donald Trump. It's mostly in uh, any totalitarian regime has sought to, uh, well, genocides often happen under these types of regimes because they cannot tolerate uh, the minority group or the weaker group, uh, those to whom their own uh, fragility is projected. And so they think that if they can project it, have the other group own it, and then eliminate that group, then they themselves will be free of that affliction. But of course, it doesn't work that way. He, he was at the uh, National Association of Black Journalists, which has become a kind of infamous car crash interview where he fought with this rather brilliant journalist who tried to hold him to account and he just went for her, accused her of asking horrible questions and not, you know, exchanging pleasantries with him at the beginning, which he did do, he just conveniently forgot, blamed her for the thing running late when he was the reason it was late, but then went on to say that Kamala Harris has an identity issue. Is she black or is she Asian? She needs to decide because she's, he's like, I don't mind, but she needs to make up her mind because it's, it's unfair to, to the people. Talk to me about this projection, this notion, because the birtherism issue obviously is a leftover from the Obama storyline for him. This yes. is racism, isn't it? Pure and simple. Yes, and his inability to, uh, well, whenever he speaks of others, he is essentially speaking of himself. That's what projection is about. And the more severe one's symptoms, the more severe the projection will be. I had an entire Twitter account that was devoted to translating Donald Trump's speech because he would be confessing over and over what was going on with him by attacking others and accusing others of his own deeds. So if, uh, if the press or the public were to understand that dynamic and not be led astray by what he is trying to manipulate and the situation he's trying to create, uh, the perceptions he's trying to create. And, and impaired individuals are far better than, than, um, normal persons who try to awkwardly create the situation. We know that he gets away with far more than uh, normal individuals would. That is because the subconscious is at work and uh, much of it is almost automatic for him. Um, and, and it creates a seamless picture where the scenario is as he says, but as we know, he is the one who brought down the stature of the entire nation. He is the one who uh, worsened situations for minorities to, to a degree where uh, Black Americans experience unprecedented deaths. Um, uh, Hispanic Americans live in constant fear and uh, he's the one who uh, ruined the economy to the point where it causes the, inf uh, the inflation. And, and, and the laughter yeah. thing is something that he struggles with. He says the rest of the world is laughing at us when the rest of the world is laughing at him, not just famously that moment at the United Nations where he said that, you know, that he's had the, you know, done the greatest 
made the greatest changes to America since ever. And, you know, all the exactly. assembled dignitaries started giggling. And, and he was like, well, I wasn't expecting that. He can't get over that, can he? So look at how you can immediately reinterpret what he is saying and turn it back on him and get a fair assessment of the actual situation. Most people are not able to do that. And that is why if mental health experts had come on the news media, uh, uh, public programs on a weekly basis, daily basis, I mean, we talk, about, we have legal experts talking about his every detail of his legal cases all the way through. Why couldn't we talk about his mental health issues uh, as they are happening every moment of the day, not just in uh, what we would identify as the mental health sphere, but all spheres, because all human affairs are affected when the mental health is affected. So, uh, so the that's the confession where we are. stuff. When he says, because the one he's been doing recently, which interests me the most, is he refers to Kamala Harris and says she's going to cheat. Now, if if every statement is a confession. He's effectively telling us that he is going to cheat at the election, which of some of us are, are, are predicting. That is his. We have to take that very operandi. seriously, don't we? Right. Yes, absolutely. There is no doubt he is going to cheat, and there is no doubt that he won't accept a loss, especially this time when he has so many supporters and so many groups backing him, uh, and he has not only been not held accountable so that his expectations would balloon on their own, but he has been actively encouraged. And people who are simply looking at ratings and numbers, as you said, or their political careers have uh, attached themselves to him uh, in ways that validate his worldview that all that matters are ratings, and popularity and number, even reality is determined by how many people you bring on to believe your lie. People seem to forget that the threat to democracy is not just him winning the election. The threat to democracy is him every day saying that there was election fraud last time when there wasn't, talking about it being rigged, the talking about or talking down on the institutions from the Justice Department to the FBI and everything in between. That is the ongoing threat to democracy, isn't it? Where people lose trust in the institutions that make up a modern democracy. And or so, even, as you say, that is not going to end, is it? Or even exclude the most relevant experts because they, uh, because intellectuals and journalists are the ones who are first to be eliminated in times of authoritarianism. Right. Because Fake news, truth, the enemy of the people. That's right. Because truth becomes a threat. And, and uh, ethical journalism represents, you know, uh, delivery of the truth. And um, intellectuals represent vigorous pursuit of the truth uh, by making accessible the best available knowledge. And that is why um, when we don't have that knowledge uh, made available to us, that we are, uh, we're bound to be victimized, misinformed, misguided, and victimized uh, to the advantage of uh, authoritarians and, and not to the benefit of democracy. In fact, the very definition of democracy is that we do need access to the information and facts that would allow us to make well-informed, rational, self-serving uh, uh, decisions as a collective whole, as rulers of ourselves. Just finally, we there's two things I have on my mind. One is that how lucky we are to, that Joe Biden did a selfless act and recognized that Kamala Harris would be a, a because he, again, you know, he took, he took the role or he decided to run for office initially when he heard Donald Trump try and both sides Charlottesville. He's stepping aside to make room for Kamala Harris because he knows that the threat to democracy is so great that it's not worth the risk. And he has to put his ego to one side to, to know that 
the amount of energy that she has for this. She also has a brilliant running mate now. And that clearly people uh, have woken up to the fact that not going back, her phrase, actually means something. And, and we would be foolish not to mention the reversal of Roe versus Wade, which is going to have a huge effect on, on the outcome of this, this election. So, so there's that. But coupled with that, my other thinking is that if there was ever a personality trait that you did not want to give power to, it's the malignant narcissist and the sociopath that Donald Trump is. He, he is literally the last person on the planet that you either want to give a presidency to or even the presidency of a local chess club because we've seen the effects of having somebody like him be handed the keys to power. Yes, absolutely. They are the most dangerous individuals in existence. It's the most dangerous psychiatric condition that wreaks more havoc than all other psychiatric conditions combined. And yet it is the most deceptive, most manipulative and difficult to detect that even requires specialists of high levels of training within psychiatry to be able to identify. And the fact that the public, that we had this knowledge, we knew uh, what kind of person he was. And we knew the level of his dangerousness, unfitness, as well as mental impairments from the very first day, and that the public was not able to gain access to that information. It was initially, but it was blocked at a key moment. And ever since, it has not gotten it in a way that uh, truly the situation warrants, uh, the danger to them warrants, is uh, speaks greatly to the to the failure of our democracy. Um, uh, I did a multi country, multi decade study of uh, countries around the world and how the democracy index affected uh, violent death rates, and uh, we found that. Um, Democracy alone was no longer able to prevent violent deaths as it largely had in the past. Once democracies stabilized, they were remarkably peaceful. Uh, but uh, lately they haven't been because democracies are not no longer real democracies. The, uh, they have such great levels of um, inequality the vast difference between um, the rich and the poor seems to negate whatever gains are made from overturning autocracies or uh, or other forms of uh, dominating governments. So that's something we probably need to look at very carefully. And uh, I speak about democracy as a sign of collective uh, mental health. I speak about that in my book, uh, The Psychology of Trump Contagion, An Existential Threat to American Democracy and All Humankind. I also speak about ways of preventing uh, such a dangerous presidency, as well as uh, a populace that would be open to such a destructive leader. And, uh, and strengthening our societal mental health in ways that will not only prevent this, but, but make even the possibility of something like this far uh, into the horizon so that, it's, uh, that, it, that it doesn't threaten us constantly. Um, it is from beginning to end, from my perspective, uh, a mental health issue that cannot be discussed without uh, a mental health perspective because, well, uh, we require mental health as mental capacity, as uh, a basic building block for our capacity to do everything else. And so, um, so that's why this issue has been so important to me not just because I'm a mental health expert, but because it has become such a societal 
crisis, really, and, and a public health emergency. Um, and so I appreciate uh, journalists like yourself who are willing to uh, buck the trend and have on, uh, have me on. Uh, I hope that we'll be able to um, hold the major uh, public national press club conference as, as we plan um, the end of next month to be able to highlight the importance of this issue. Okay. Well, we are very grateful for your expertise. And I, and I should say that, you know, you and I have been talking in this, in this forum for a couple of years now, and, and everything you've said both before we started talking and since has come true. And I think that that is a testament to your, your experience, your expertise and your, and your skill. And we're very, very grateful to you, Dr. Bandy Lee. Thank you for joining The Weekend Show. Thank you very much for having me. I'm Anthony Davis. Don't forget to support me and independent journalism at patreon.com slash 5-Minute News. See more of me on the 5-Minute News YouTube channel. And I'll be back next Sunday with a brand new special guest and more factual news to discuss on the 5-Minute News Weekend Show with Midas Touch. <laughs>